This bonus episode features an interview with our 2021 Freedom Filmmaker of the Year, Rodney Roldan, director of Remembering Private Quagliano and Country and Courage. Now we have Rodney Roldan who has submitted and won Best Doc Short a couple of times this year already. Rodney, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? <laughs> uh, I'm excellent. Now, before I ask you anything, are we getting a doc short from you from December for December? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> uh, well, you're we'll probably plan on doing something next year, but <laughs> well, I look forward to it. Um, so, can you tell the listeners here who is Rodney Rodan? What what is your history and what are your interests? My history. Wow. So, so I was uh, born and raised in New York. I grew up in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, right after high school, I joined Navy and I spent nine years of active duty. Uh, prior to getting out of the Navy, I got into acting in film, television, and stage work. Um, and I did that for a couple of years before I went into the Army Reserve when I was in Los Angeles. Um, the reason why I did that was I had nine years of active service, but I also wanted to continue my career as a performing artist. So I didn't want to throw that away. So I figured going into the reserve, I could still do my military time while at the same time, you know, working on my performing arts career. Um, later on, I got, so in, so let me just go back a little bit. So in the army, I actually worked in mass communications. Um, and that's where I started getting into documentary filmmaking. Mm. Um, and so, you know, there's like a little bit of skills that you learn there and then combining that with the experience of being on set and looking at other directors and cinematographers and how they do their work. So I was able to, you know, get into that. And I kind of always been into uh, telling stories and, and reenacting things. Um, I remember when I uh, got into acting, <laughs> my mother told me, well, when you were a kid, you used to always uh, build fake sets, like build a police station or a hospital or... <laughs> A, a war that's awesome <laughs> like a, a battlefield and and act out the characters in it so i knew you know maybe as a kid i guess i was really into the creative side and then participating in it as well so when i got into you know performing arts you know i saw that as well and then i kind of fell in love with not only acting in it or you know writing but also creating the scene you know, and that's right. something you get to do when you're making films or any kind of documentary. You get to use a creative way to tell someone else's story. That's really awesome. So how much of filmmaking is, is on your mind while you're in the military? I, I, have you always enjoyed films and, and thought about that? Yeah, I always, um, I, I like, I'm one of those people that like epic films, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like a lot of times, you know, I know there's all the like the Marvel movies and comedies and things like that that are entertaining, but I was always one of those people that like to sit through three hour movies. Like one of my favorite movies was There Will Be Blood. Yes. You know, and it's um, and it, yeah, and it's it's long. So how do you sit through this? And I said, well, it's just amazing because it, the movies like that, like epic movies, kind of draw you in, and if you get to live with the character, especially if the you know the actor or the actress is doing doing the job of you know drawing the audience in so i kind of like those kind of movies and also it has a historic sense of, like i like things that have history in it right. you know i talk about the past and retell those stories um but the funny thing is <laughs> so being in the military right and then being in performing arts a lot of people say well how, how do you manage that like what's the difference well the thing is like i mentioned before in the army i work in mass communications where we are telling the stories of other soldiers or the army itself and we get to do things like mini docs or commercials or spots, I should say, and news package stories where we, you know, or write them out as well and photography and things like that. So really, there isn't a difference. You know, it's like what I do in the military really, you know, transcends into the civilian world and vice versa. That's really cool. I, I never thought about. You know, communications in the military, spinning someone into becoming a documentary filmmaker, um, that's something that that seems obvious now, but I hadn't thought about before. <laughs> and it's so unique and it's so cool that you were able to take that experience and the education as a job and turn it into uh, this art that you're creating now, this informative 
art that you're creating now. So uh, we ha- obviously we've really enjoyed your submissions, remembering Private Quigliano and Country and Courage. Uh, these have just blown us away. They've won their respective months for the submissions, and I'm um, pretty sure it wasn't even close. So uh, <laughs> congratulations there. And I, let me ask you a little bit about remembering Private Quigliano. This was submitted to us in June, and again, won Best Doc Short in June. What inspired this film? Well, so the thing is, actually, I started that back in 2015. I was overseas with a soldier in my unit, and she was telling me about, we were in Germany doing a two-week assignment, and she was telling me about her grandfather, who was a POW near where we were supposed to have our assignment at. We were in Grafenbeer, and he was near there. And um, initially, I started with, I wanted to do a three-minute piece on her, talking about her grandfather. But then we ended up going to the actual site, and as I started filming and talking to her more about it, I, you know, this deserves its due attention. And it turned into something that was going to be 10 minutes long. And then as I learned more and more about the story, then I decided to do a full story on it. Yeah, I, I I get that. As you see that it's really interesting, it's easy to <laughs> extend that. Um, so you used uh, archive footage in Remembering Private Quigliano. Can you tell us about securing that footage? Yeah, so with this project, so, okay, so before this, in 2014, when I was in Afghanistan, I um, I was working with the Air Force, and they wanted me to do a a Memorial Day video. And I ended up working on that as well. That I that wasn't submitted to a lot of festivals and things like that. I kind of did that internally, but I ended up releasing it on, you know, YouTube later on as well. And it got good it got good feedback. But anyway, so when I did that one, I noticed that one of the problems that I ran into was not having enough footage to support what I wanted to show. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's something that I had in the back of my mind. So when I got into this project, I thought, well, the first thing I need to do is secure a large pool of visuals that I need to use. Right. So I ended up writing a couple of letters out and looking at different sites. And I came across the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And I wrote them a letter and I said, hey, you know, this is I'm working on this project. I'm a soldier in the U.S. Army and this is where I'm trying to go with. And they were awesome. They literally emailed me. A, a tons of large files wow. of footage from the Steven Spielberg film and video archives. And the only thing they wanted was to credit them. That's and so after amazing. I was going through this footage, I realized that a lot of it was from army public affairs during world war two, which is the same job field that I'm currently in, in the army. Wow. <laughs> so I, you know, so I had all this stuff in there and then, um, the, and, and I think it was, so one of the hardest things with that too, is like when you're looking at hours of footage, yeah, it's good. You have hours, but then you also have to sift through hours of footage and try to capture the best elements that you're going to use to tell a story. So that, that's something that took a long time to do. Well, I'm sure it did. Uh, choosing selects, especially when you didn't shoot the footage, that's, that's something that you have to watch every frame. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, how long did this entire process take? for your post, once you got that archive footage, how long did it take to complete? Well, see, this this is something that I spent, I spent a few years on, not that it took years if you compress the time, but it was more of when I got, when it was available to do certain things. For example, um, so the, I actually shot, shot the first area was in Germany, and that's when uh, I had her, the subject matter at the place where her father was a POW. Mm -hmm. So that was the first thing I shot. So I had to work backwards, right? So I I thought, okay, so then maybe I need to interview her at home. But then she introduced me to her uncle, who's obviously the son of of, uh, Private Quagliano. So I interviewed him as well. So I had to make arrangements to get them both at the same time to interview them at their house. So that took some time. Then after that, I said, okay, well, once I get this footage, I got to sift through this. But you know, at the time, I was also working on my communications degree and in the military as well and acting as well. So I had all these different things going on. So whenever I had time, I started cutting up the footage. Then in 2017, by that time, I wrote the script and what I wanted to say and I ended up recording that 
while I was in Kentucky at Fort Knox. And then there, that's when I had the opening shot by the tanks at the Patent Museum. Yeah. Oh, so okay. I wrote another letter and they said, well, you're in public affairs. You should be easy. It should be easy for you to, you know, get, get a shot there. So I made it arrangements for that. And then after a few weeks, they said, yeah, here's a date. You can go and shoot the opening there. So I did that. So I have a different locations altogether, but I would say by 2017, I had all the elements that I needed and then came to editing. Yeah. <laughs> and as usual, that takes forever. So I was editing constantly, and then I wanted to have it premiere uh, on Veterans Day at the uh, the VFW in, in Whitestone in the Bronx, in mm. New York, and that's where it did. So for your premiere, what was that experience like? It was, I, I feel a little bit emotional because the the family was there. You know, you have the, the, the you know, the, you had uh, Joseph, which is a son, and then you had Nicole as well, the daughter, the granddaughter, and and then her aunt, and other people that knew him, and friends and family. So it was it was really it was something. And for me to sit there and see their reaction because they hadn't seen it up to that point, mm. you know. So to to have them their reaction firsthand that was that was new, you know. And then to yeah. see the impact it had. But I think I think for me it was more of. Um, you know, I, I wanted to. I wanted them to like what I did. You know, to do it justice. But I think after after a while, I started to understand that the why you do some things like that. You know, a lot of times, I, I think for this one, I didn't pay too much attention to the aesthetics. Like I felt like some of the sound was off, and you know, the footage. But again, it was like a learning experience. Sure. But I did see that the story itself had an impact on the family members and friends watching it, and to me that was the takeaway that, okay, I did, you know, that's the, the fact that they saw that and, and affected them in a good way. Then, then I thought, you know, that was, that was it. The job was done, you know? Absolutely. There, what a blessing for that family to have you be so interested and dedicated uh, to, to not even only, only conceive of making this a story, but following through and making it even longer and then submitting to film festivals and winning awards. <laughs> uh, yeah. that, I mean, that's that's just so cool for them, uh, so cool for you. So at what point in your journey here did you start conceiving of this Country and Courage documentary? Well, <clears throat> so I got on after I left, let's see, so during COVID. <laughs> so in New York, I, was, uh, I had some projects lined up that I was acting in, and because of you know, COVID that didn't work out. So I ended up getting on um, a tour in Georgia with the army. So that's like, so in the army reserve, you have your reserve time where you, you have like a, a weekend, a month kind of thing, two right. weeks for annual training. Well, I got on active duty orders, but this was, you know, for me to be stationed in one spot, more of an admin position kind of thing. Okay. So I came down to Georgia and I knew in the future, like after doing, but people say, well, what's your next one? What do you, and I knew I wanted to do something, but I didn't have, um, there were a couple of ideas lingering prior to that. Like I, one of the uh, girls I know in the air force and she's overseas right now, we talked about doing something with vaccines. Hmm. And then my daughter, she's, um, she's a good, she's a great artist as well. And a photographer. And we talked about working on a documentary as well. Oh, cool. Um, and different, you know, different subjects, but, when I got this to Georgia, it was like a lot of those things didn't pan out just because of timing and stuff. So one of the things I thought of doing was something with veterans. Um, I did a small video, like a three minute video in 2013 about veterans day. And this time around, I thought, Hmm, I want to do something for veterans, but I didn't want to stick with what you see a lot of, which is patriotism on the surface. You know, what our military appears to be in the outside. Mm-hmm. Right. So I wanted to get to the core of who we are and of those that served before me, you know, and, and people got to understand that, you know, we're all human beings and have feelings. Right. You know, and we also have there's a lot of us with, you know, like we're strong in the outside, but a lot of us have delicate souls. Right. Amen. <laughs> and that's not protected from seeing things or experiencing what we didn't expect, you know, because right. we can always go with like shields. Right. But unless you like it's easy to justify what could happen than actually dealing with dealing with it when it does happen. Hmm. You know, and the experiences that a lot of people have in 
traumatic events brings them face to face with who they are inside and what they can tolerate. So I wanted to speak from that perspective and hopefully help the audience understand who we are or who those are that served before are on the inside. And, you know, and with that, I also wanted to incorporate the arts into it. And that's where the Shakespeare came in. Um, I, I've always been a fan of Shakespeare and its plays, but I think I got more into it when I attended Stella Adler Studio of Acting in New York. I went there for two years. And both my Shakespeare teachers, they were awesome. And they kind of helped me understand the story that Shakespeare was telling and the fact that he literally wrote about war and love. <laughs> yeah. So when I'm looking at that, it's like, well, there's a lot of stuff in there that relates. So with this, I said, okay, so I'm going to tell the story and have people open up, but then how do I incorporate, you know, the, the arts into this? And then I remember that I watched this play called Cry Havoc. And that's why I had Stefan Wolfert in it as well. So I remember seeing that play and I said, you know, he uses Shakespeare for therapy and, and, you know, helping veterans as he states in the, in the documentary. And so I was like, Hmm, what if I, you know, you're not just going to tell people about this, but what if you were showing it and what if you visualized it? So that's where I kind of came up with having the monologue performances and then tie that in with military visuals to tell that part. Um, the, and I apologize from all over the place. Oh, no, <laughs> this is to, great. But, yeah, I love learning about this. <laughs> but but initially, it, the, the funny thing is, let me go back a little bit. So when, sure. I, when I was talking about this, I one of the guys that it's in my unit, Luke Wilson, he's the one that got the uh, two interviews of uh, Lieutenant Bandy mm -hmm. and uh, JT, which which are really good friends of his. So that was a, a plus, you know, to help this. But um, when we spoke about it, I said, you know, I want to do something about veterans. So it became this big general topic. So the, the topic changed. It went from overall veterans to Army veterans itself, from veteran, the Veterans Administration and how it relates to soldiers and healing to more of the arts. So in the video or in the documentary, I talk about veterans programs later on and just mention a few, but that was supposed to be a larger part of it. And the Shakespeare was supposed to be have, have monologues guide the whole documentary, kind of mm -hmm. like a background with uh, quotes and here and there. So I didn't, I didn't know how I was going to tell that story, how I was going to mix the monologues in it. And, and even, even those that were helping me um, with some of the interviews and, and like my friend, Eric uh, Supercasa, the one that does the, one of the uh, monologues, right. he said, you know, this is going to be great, but how are you going to tell the story? How, how are you going to tie Shakespeare with this? <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of people didn't see that, but, but in, for me, it's like, being a fan of Shakespeare and also getting a lot of help from uh, Jack Weatherall. He was my um, instructor at Stella Adler and he did a zoom call with us prior to preparing the monologues and going through different monologues that actually you would be great to speak about. So that was really helpful. But he, you know, that question came up and not just from him, from a lot of people They said, well, I don't understand. When I saw you saying you're going to you know, tie Shakespeare in the, cause I, I, I did the intro and I sent that out the beginning of it when it says, you know, this, this program talks about the, you know, army soldier experiences and then, and the writings of William Shakespeare. That's where people said, I don't know how you're going to do that. But <laughs> <Yeah. I'll see. laughs> but right. The thing is, but I, I knew what I was doing with it because I already, I knew about these monologues and I knew, and I understood the, how Shakespeare relates to us, you know? And then even it's mentioned, you know, when I do the interview with Peter Friedrich that they, these, you know, the, the language of Shakespeare, like he always talks about, like I said, soldiers, war, love, things like that. So I knew what, how I wanted to include it, but then it was like, okay, how do I visually support that? And so, you know, when the vet, when the VA portion dropped out, and then I had to fill X amount of time with this. And the reason why I was targeting, so I, I told everybody I have to do for above 40 minutes. Well, why 40 minutes? It's like, we got a feature, you know? Right. And, you know, one of the things, it's like lessons learned from previous, right? So Quagliano, when I did Quagliano, it was 22 minutes. And I realized that there wasn't a lot of places I can send this because of the time. Right. So if you do a feature, there's, there's different. I mean, it depends on it depends on the festival. It depends on the, you know, awards category. I know that the sure. Academy Award looks at it. I think it's 50 minutes. Or yeah. forty, I think it's forty minutes. It, it, the Academy looks at that, yeah, but I think you're right. PBS is fifty minutes. 
it depends on the time. So, but I wanted to make it longer, you know, not just because it was all this information, but also I wanted to have a bigger venue for it or a bigger variety of where it could be shown. I see. Okay. You know? Yeah. So that's, that's how I ended up with that. If that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's, I mean, that's great insight. I mean, it's such a, it's so beautifully done. I mean, the sound, the, the, the interview shots are amazing. And, and I, I mean, me personally, I love this tying in Shakespeare to their experience and learning about uh, veterans using these monologues to process their experiences. I thought it was brilliant. Certainly, I, I didn't know anything about it prior to watching your film. And when I saw that that come up when the when it starts, I'm like, okay, we're getting some Shakespeare. <laughs> Let's see what he does. And sure enough, I mean, I was just glued to the thing. Um, so and so was Dre. But uh, I mean, it's just such a wonderful film, and you should be extraordinarily proud of that. Let me ask you some some questions here. Uh, when you were creating Country and Courage, what was the hardest part? about it just from a technical standpoint See, okay and that's and that's i'm glad you brought that up because there's you, you know we you know as an artist right we have a creative way of thinking you know the whole thing in science talks about right right and left brain sure yeah. <laughs> so a lot of times when you say anything technical everybody's thinking okay mathematics you can't think practical and things like that so one of the challenges i mean i, I wouldn't say that's a challenge i would say that that enhanced it because for me it's the first thing I thought of was, you know, I close my eyes and I say, okay, what do I want to see? Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm all, sometimes when I'm editing, I go with feeling. So to, to be honest, the, the one thing that I first focused on was music, believe it or not. Right. And like, I have a love for music. I, I'm not involved with it. I can play the instruments. I can, I can play the like drums and things like that. But oh, wow. what I mean is just music in general. I love music. And yeah. like when I'm exercising, I'm listening to it when I'm driving, when, when, whenever, you know, having coffee or something, and it depends on the mood, you know, like what type of music you listen to. But right. I absolutely love music, especially uh, anything like the classical type, right. Or opera, things like that. Oh. So when I sat back, I said, okay, what, what do I want to emote from someone? Or what do I want to emote from this documentary? So the very first thing was music. And then from the music, I was able to build on top of that. And, it's, and that's one of the things that, for me, look, from a technical point of view, it was like the sound had to be on point. Because, you know, when I did a couple of other documentaries before that, including Cogliano, there's like some pops in there and, you know, like crackling and things like that. So I said, you know, if sound is off, it can throw your mind off. It can throw your focus off. I'm like, so the first thing that has to be on point is sound. So that was one of the hardest challenges. Was like, okay, get the sound right, get everything correct. And then hey, I did preach that. it. The second, preach it, Rodney. Nine. Tell them, preach yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then the second thing, and, and so this is funny. So in this, because I know I mentioned earlier about getting the the footage, right? The pool of footage. Mm -hmm. Well. The wrench that got thrown at me here was because initially I wanted to go with the Veterans Administration and how, you know, that related. I focused a lot of footage on that. Huh. <laughs> so when I had to shift gears, I found myself with an eight minute gap. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what to fill this in with, right? So I was like, oh, great. This is going to be, well, then think. And then the other challenge was the banding interview, the bandy interview mm -hmm. that uh, Wilson provided. So I sat with him and I said, how much, how many hours is this? And he said, well, it's about two hours, you Whoa. know, of footage. Yeah. Yeah. So now I'm thinking, oh God, because <laughs> the, the other thing is I was trying to release this on Veterans Day and this is me editing. I, I, I'm, I'm not even lying about this. Five days prior, I only had five minutes of footage laid out. Oh my gosh. So in five days, I had to lay out 35 minutes. Wow. Of footage, of narration, of you know, organizing all this. And that's where the coffee comes into play. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I mean the, the the day before I dropped it, before I before I, I dropped the project on the tenth, uh -huh. I literally I was I, I tell I tell them I was from one PM to nine ten AM the next day I was up straight. Yeah. Just <laughs> dropping it. <laughs> so I was like the footage and before I release it. So um yeah, so there was there was a lot of 
you know, but but the good thing is is so I, I also go to school for communications. I'm working on my PhD now. Oh, good so for I you. had uh yeah, I, I had my, my bachelor's was in communications and my master's was in visual communication as well. So I learned, you know, since two thousand fourteen till now, you know, a combination between the military and college and just practicing and then just being an actor on set and, and, and you know, seeing other creatives and cinematographers and directors work, I was able to apply a lot of those lessons learned up to this point. Right. So, yeah, it was challenging technically, but I think my mind easily gravitated to how I was going to get it. It was like, what do you want? That's the hard part. And then, okay, this is how you get it. So I think it was easier for me to like, you know, hop on it and uh, get going and, and get all the stuff that I needed and work like a maniac trying to put it in place. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I think I can really relate to your process because I think it is really important to ask yourself, what do I want to see? And then music drives my uh, work as well. And it's very much emotionally driven. I, you know, I'm like, what is this story telling me? How do I want people to feel? How is this footage making me feel? And what is the soundscape? And I think if you really concentrate on those foundations and lay that bed that you're just, you're going to be on a path to success. Um, and you certainly did that correctly. And at, <laughs> All you've done here is made me feel like I've done nothing with my life. (laughs) (laughs) Just PhDs and and all this military service. And I'm just like, oh, wow. Well, I don't know. I thought I was pretty cool when I got a PS5, but (laughs) I guess I guess I got to try harder. (laughs) I think, think, you know, I have uh, it's always like the the grass is always green on the other side. You know what I mean? So I think, yeah. Um, yeah, I think all of us have, you know, there, there's always, believe it or not, there's always some, you know, lifestyle or, you know, somebody else that I look at. And I said, well, that, that's, that's admirable. But I think um, one thing I, I guess, I don't know, I guess you do, do it to life or tribute to life in general is that I think I've, um, I've always been appreciative of other people doing things as well. You know, like yeah. I don't. You know, you know how it is in this industry where people get competitive. Oh, I, I <laughs> haven't they, heard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and they, you know, for for me, I think, um, I think part of the the passion and the love that I have for doing anything creative is that I I like involving other people and I like seeing them do it because it, it kind of it's like, w- w- especially being an actor and, and being in the military, I always try to get other soldiers to become actors as well. Oh, that's <laughs> that's like, cool. That's why, good. Why would you want to do that? That raises the competition. I'm like, no, it doesn't because we're all unique. Yeah, you know, and that's absolutely. the thing. Everyone is a unique person. There's no, there's there's not another you in this world. You know, so it's like if you're gonna make something, it's it, how it comes from you is gonna be different than it, how it comes from anyone else. So for me, it's like the more people that are in the art and you know working in it, 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 it it's like a livelihood too. So you know, being in the military and combining arts with it and making things that combine both, to me that that I I, I feel complete with that. You know. Yeah, I and, love that. Um, yeah, and it's and it, and it's and you can find it. Like a lot of people want to, we we try to divide stuff in society too much. Like categorize it. Like you, this belongs here, and that's one thing that right. I found strange in my life is the fact that uh, people, even to this day, and I mentioned earlier, to say, "Well, how are you in the arts and in the military? Where's the relation in that?" It's like, are you serious? Yeah, <laughs> there is. You know, and but right. but it, it's not it's not their fault because I was talking to um to Wilson today as well, and I said. You know, I blame the army for that because mm. we have a lot of um, a lot of great jobs. You know, and you know, and I'm not one. I can't criticize the way media or how things are promoted, but um, you know, people really don't know all the things that we do in the military. Oh, sure. You know, they think it's not to say that you know we don't resort to you know fighting and wars and things like that because at the end of the day, we're all soldiers. Right. However, you know, there's a lot of there's a variety of how information is told, especially nowadays, because that's like the new frontier mm-hmm. is information. So in that, you know, they, they have certain soldiers or sailors or, you know, airmen and, you know, Marines that are charged with doing that job. And I think it's amazing. And I think, the, you know, a lot of people should learn more about that because I think it also would attract more people to go into the field. I think your next 
step in your career might be a recruiter. <laughs> I'm going to go sign up right now and get into communications. <laughs> of course, they'll probably tell me, sure, we'll get you into communications. No problem. And we'll see where, where they really put me. But, <laughs> but that's wonderful, man. So where can people see these films that you've made? Okay, so so Country and Courage, I uh, made that. That's available on the on. So the site it's called it's Divid, but it's actually um. I, well, I kind of call it the the YouTube for the Department of Defense. <laughs> okay. But um, yeah, but it actually it's the Defense Visual Information Distribution Service. So basically, it's so anytime ma- anything done in the mass communications field in the military is put on this site where people can you know download it for free. And a lot of companies do that, like a lot of news agencies, a lot of television shows, production companies, they download our footage oh. to use it. So that's where okay. I currently have it. And I also put it on YouTube as well. So okay. it's free to watch. Remembering Private Quagliano, the, the difference in that one <laughs> is that that's actually distributed by Adler and Associates out of L.A. So oh. when I when I did it, it so it, that's kind of a, a weird story with there and I it's not a good or bad thing. It's just a lesson learned. So I'll put it that way. Mm. So <laughs> when I did it, I was initially, I wanted to do it in the military side. But at the time when I was, I was using my own equipment to film it. And because the locations didn't have anything to do with the military other than the subject matter. And because I was doing voiceover for it, then I had to make it a union project through the Screen Actors Guild. Mm. And, I, and I've been a member of that since, 2005 basically so when i did that i had to turn it into a union film now with that there's all this other rules and regulations that oh, go with yeah. it. so when i when i did it i decided to uh distribute it so i sent it to a distributor in la so they they have the rights for it okay now, yeah so that's why that one i because that was sending me the link it's like oh, i can't like i have my personal one <laughs> that I can right share. right okay but, um well, I think yeah, it's it, but that one. They can go to Adler and Associates, their site, and they have the film in there. So. Okay. Considering all of your experience now, uh, what advice <laughs> would you offer to other documentary filmmakers? What have you learned? Well, the first, I mean, I tell you, the biggest thing that I learned is know what story you're going to tell and how it will be told visually, and then I would say get the music to help tell that story as well. That is very um, solid advice. <laughs> yeah, because that's, uh, you know, we, again, we were talking about music earlier and storytelling. Um, because, you know, it's funny, I, I, I'm going to leave back to music as well, if you don't mind. But yeah. for me, I think it's, it's all about rhythm, right? And, you know, that, that's like something that a lot of DJs would use and, and music artists as well when they're composing. They said, well, what rhythm do you want to set at? That's why a lot of times when you hit, listen to like fast-paced music, like techno or house music, they raise the BPM because it's like, okay, this will get people to, you know, kind of gravitate towards that higher beat, get some dancing. Right. And then, you know, you, you have a lower tempo because you set the mood. If someone wants to go to sleep, they listen to that. So the same way is like, how, that's how we experience it in ourselves. I said, well, why can't films be the same way? Absolutely. You know, and I know that a lot of them, uh, that sounds cliche because a lot of them do understand that but it's easy like i said it's easy to see something and do it but then understand it for yourself so for me i was thinking okay so the first thing is what's the temple of the story you know and then you got the temple of the story down so what's that music going to support it how would you support it you know you see these documentaries on netflix and amazon and i and i love these random documentaries on netflix as well they they have the one um the explained one and then there's one on how movies. One of my favorites actually recently is the movies that, that make, make it make it. Oh, yeah, bro. I, oh, God, those, right? I cannot... those make me want to <laughs> jump up and go make a movie right now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But, but a lot of times, uh, like I, I am a big, it, it's funny because, you know, even though I, I love performing arts and, and acting, a lot of times people would think, oh, do you, do you watch other actors and things like that? Not necessarily. I, I watch the, production side of things Mm -hmm. you know because for me it's like without the production then the acting can't take place all right directing can't take place without the lighting without the film without the setting without the wardrobe things like that 
So I like big picture, the nitty gritty of how things are done. So when I saw that program, I was like, wow, this is amazing. But yeah, but with that, I brought that up because that's like a fast paced kind of thing. Right. You know, the constant moving and oh, this, and it's kind of comedic, right. but not. And so that kind of the mood is it gets you motivated, like, oh, I want to do what they're doing. Exactly. You know, and then you see other documentaries where it's more mellow. And then I kind of get you that. So that's something that I realized that learned from other filmmakers and watching other programs that they do. And then, okay, so I need to incorporate that in it myself. And that's where I like when you're, when you're making it, you first close your eyes a lot. One of the things that, you know, I did something I'm sure other filmmakers learn in film school and you know, performing arts or whatever. But I remember when I attended uh defense information school and that's where, that's where we go. And that's not just for the army. That's for the all branches. Mm-hmm. When we become, you know, in our field, we all trained it. But one of the things they said is, you know, video is for the ear. Yeah. And, and I said, well, yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, because it's not, so when I was doing this, it's like, I always, well, I always walk away, close my eyes and listen to it. And I, and I, and I listen to the narration and the music. And then it's like, okay, what, what do I want to see? And then that's where, so a lot of people have a process. So my pro, like I said, my process is the music, words, and then the footage. I think that's, you know? and, that's brilliant. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So that's, yeah. So that's kind of, that that's my thing too. And then and another thing I would say is, you know, it, I, I'm kind of stubborn at times. I admit that, but Good. I think, <laughs> open, but open yourself up to, you, you know, it, well, it, it's kind of strange because, you know, constructive criticism or criticism, I, I ask for that. Like a lot of times, and I know, and I'm sure you're an artist as well, so you know this, but like a lot of times we say, you know, well, tell me, we, we don't want to hear the great things. You tell me what isn't working. Right. You know, but I think, um, but as a filmmaker or any, any kind of artist, like you, it, you have to be open to that. Now, of course, yeah. there are opinions. Everybody has their opinion, you know, sure. but it depends on where it's coming from. But for me, it's like, I know the difference between an opinion that's there just to be critical or someone with an opinion that is looking to assist you of course. in, and you know, things like that. So, but that, that's one thing as a, as an artist, you have to be, especially as a filmmaker, you have to be open to that. Yeah. And, but you have to be open enough not to let go of your foundation, but enough to, divert from it while keeping that strength you know because if we leave that then we lose our base then we lose our creativity you know absolutely and just to add on to that what i like to tell people when when it comes to criticism is that um i believe any type of you know we call it we're saying criticism but feedback any type of opinion that somebody has that's an opportunity for you to hear something from somebody else's perspective and let that challenge what your, uh, you know, maybe biased beliefs are about what you've created. And it'll let you know either you completely disagree with what the feedback is, or you mm-hmm. look at that feedback and go, oh, maybe, maybe that's true. Or you might hear the feedback and go, yeah, I knew that was true. I was hoping to slip it by. <laughs> <laughs> and no one would notice, but clearly it stands out. But it challenges you to take a look at what that feedback might be. And and you can decide at that point, is that valid? Is that something I could try to work on? Or no, is this the way I want it? And I, I always appreciate that kind of feedback because it just kind of lets me know where I stand internally. Um, and, right. and I think that's just good advice. Yeah, and the thing is, and that's a, that's, it, it's a crazy world we live in because everyone it, it's funny because um there, there was a study that they did on social media right and they were saying how you know some people say there's all this negative stuff on social media but they, there's a couple of studies that they did and then they said actually no it, it there's a generally even amount of positive and negative posts on social media hmm. right but it's just where people where they stand so of course you ask me your opinion on something you're going to get more than likely half and half sure right um one thing about, um, you know, for me, it's always, like I said, it's always a learning, you know, everything's a learning lessons learned next, 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 you just keep moving. Right. But one thing that was different about, uh, the country encouraged that I received versus the other projects that I did 
was um, everyone that has watched it, they've all had very interesting um, feedback that was really good. So for me, I I was like, whoa, okay, I guess this is really good. I don't mean it like that. Yeah, no, yeah. No, it's, <laughs> no, it's, I mean, it's I nice know, to get that like validation. Said, we all want it. We all want it, Roger. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we do. But, but for me, but but I but the question I asked was it yeah okay great you you liked it but then I started asking what specifically mm-hmm. and I got so many different interesting answers and and one of them that I didn't really think about and it was kind of like a little gem that I hid inside and I didn't really talk about this but um do you remember the part where you have uh, Stefan Wolfert during his Cry Havoc performance he's talking about the Harlem Hellfighters right yes yes well in high school I was in Marine ROTC, right? And we were at the 369th Armory. Then before I went into the Navy, I, I knew I was going into the Navy 17 turning 18. Wow. So I wanted some military experience prior to going to Navy. So I actually joined the New York Guard at 16. Well, huh. the New York Guard is the Harlem Hellfighters. So I was at the 369th Armory in high school for the Harlem Youth Marine Cadets and for the New York Guard. And so... I kind of hid that in there until someone wow. mentioned, why'd you put that in there? Well, not only because he mentioned it, but it was kind of a cool connection that yeah. I didn't expect that, that he would talk about that. I didn't know that he was going to talk about that. So when I heard that, I said, oh, I got to include it. Plus, I, I know I know this place. Like, I, I've gone there. I'm, I was part of that. And um, so I hid that in there. But the reason why I brought that up is because one of the uh, girls that I saw it and she spoke to me, she said she didn't even know about them. You know, black female, and she didn't know that there was an all black regiment, hmm. you know, in World War One that earned this medal, the first unit to earn this medal. And, you know, and it's like he mentions, we're all American, and it's, but for her, you know, it, it was, you know, people finding heroes in different areas. And so for her to point that out and say, well, why don't we know about that? Hey, yeah, right. You, you see what I'm saying? So There's a lot me, of great like, stuff that's not. Thought. <laughs> yeah, and that's true. so then I was like, you know what? What? Why don't we know about that? You know, and it's it's like, well, dude, that might be your next project. <laughs> yeah, you know, like just things like that. You start thinking of, but but there's, but I, I think, and then another person, you know, spoke about how they didn't know. The majority of them spoke about they didn't know the relationship between Shakespeare and 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 soldiers using that for models, like programs that are out there with you know. Right. Like Shakespeare for veterans or decruit. So, you know, that for me, it was like, okay, what the end result is, did it help someone? Yes. Mm-hmm. The message got out. Okay. Well, then that's, then that's the job. That's, that's the purpose. You know, right. we look at things for entertainment purposes. Yeah. It's, but it, but for this kind of filmmaking, it's not necessarily entertaining, but a call to action in a way that gets the audience to act. And that's the challenge with it. But that's the, I'm sorry I'm going deep into that. No, but it, that's, it, hey, I just, could keep talking to you for a while, man. This is, <laughs> I love it. I mean, no, I, I appreciate it. But I'm thinking, I'm thinking, you know, okay, Rodney's 16, ROTC in the guard. When I was 16, I was skipping school, partying, and in a recording studio because <laughs> uh, I was going to be an awesome rapper. But, but no, you go ahead and do those other things. <laughs> I just, I just want to quit now, <laughs> man. You are an impressive well, individual, Rodney. No, I appreciate it. I, I kind of see myself as always trying to chase what I want. Like I, I feel like I didn't really know what I wanted to do until mm-hmm. I was twenty-seven. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. You know, because I think you just experiment with um, a lot of different things. You know, and it's hard. Like growing up, growing up in New York is it was really hard because um, and, and but I look back and I appreciate a lot of things, but. It's a very overwhelming, challenging place. And, you know, when you grow up there, there's a lot of industry around you, especially oh, the sure. arts. You know, like you grow, so I, I grow, you grow up watching, you know, plays and hearing about like hip hop artists and musicians and singers and, and actors and all these people. And it's not like you, you like, I, I, I don't remember as a kid that I didn't think that I was going to be in that field, but I knew that I loved it. Right. You know, I, there were moments where, you know, my older brother, he, he played a guitar and everything, but we would go to, you know, um, the music stores, like Sam Ash Music down in uh, 
you know, in the in, the, <laughs> in Times Square area, right. you know. And we'll go to like Music Row, you know. Well, the Music Row, you have one in Nashville, but but in New York, you had all the 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 music shops there. So we go in there and play instruments, and and you know. And then in high school, I, I played the drums a little bit in this little band that we had, the hmm. talent show. So you get into these kind of things, but it's kind of you're you're fed all these different opportunities. So it's easy to get lost in there. Like I admire, believe it or not, and it all sounds crazy, but I admire people that knew exactly what they wanted to do mm-hmm. when they left school and then they did it because, and that's the whole grass is always green on the other side. You know, like we right. all look at each other and say, Oh, that's nice. Nah, cool. He's doing that. But for me, it, you know, I was like, that, that's amazing that you knew that because for me, I had to do all these different things to realize, okay, this is what I want to do. I can. Comp- uh, uh, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, and I'm not taking away from that. It's just more of the, um, but at the same time, people still, to me, it's not crazy, but people think that I'm crazy for doing a bunch of things at the same time. Like they say, you're in the military, you're going to school and you're doing, you know, entertainment industry or whether it's filmmaking or acting, mm-hmm. how the hell you do it? And it's like, well, for me, it, it's just, I, I guess it's just during the moment, right? Like when you're taking a shower, are you worried about eating? No, because <laughs> right. you're, you're the moment you're in the shower, you're in the shower, right? right. Well, some people, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, sometimes I'm drinking in the shower, in the yeah. dark, but no, not eating. <laughs> but yeah, but you, but you do what you do in the moment when you're driving to work, you know, you can't be preoccupied with what you're going to make for dinner because right. in the moment you're driving. So I kind of look at the things we do in life, whether it's one, two, three, ten things as you can do them all, but it's just give it its time, you know, and how, how much time you want to do it, you know? And I think depending I mean, on the, in, the, depending on the individual, you don't know any different yeah. than, than that, you know, so what you might be doing is just not somebody else's capacity or understanding, but they're probably doing right. several things that you wouldn't be doing at the same time. <laughs> Uh, but yeah. I think your story, I think that approach and being involved in so many mediums like that is very relatable to other filmmakers. Um, I, I mean, if Rodney, if you listen to the Take 22 podcast that I have, by the time our words are, are going to be on the internet, um, I'll have announced that I'm dropping my own podcast uh, later on this month called Take 22. And, um, <laughs> and on that, I also discussed the fact that as a child, I was a loner child who was often alone most of the time. And I drew cartoons mm-hmm. and I drew my own comic books. And then as a teenager and, and young man in my early 20s, I was um, you know, into music. I was a rapper. And then after I had a child and settled down, I was married. And I wasn't, and it probably wasn't until I was about 30 that I realized, oh, I want to make films and and do all these things. Now, I had started that actually when I was a young teenager also, but I did just never realized uh why I liked it. And I think ultimately we're storytellers. We're artists mm-hmm. and we're storytellers. And whatever these tools are, be it your drum set or you know, uh me writing lyrics or us shooting films today, we're just artists who are storytellers and and it comes out in many ways. And painters are storytellers and photographers are storytellers. Uh, so I think that's relatable to to all of us um, in, right. in the arts. Yeah, and it's yeah, and that's why it's so easy to understand each other when we're talking that language. Um, my uh, the other uh, Dave McDonald, she's my uh, good friend here, but mm-hmm. he's also I would say we're all the same because he's also a an actress, but in the military as well, and we do the same job. But um, one thing we were talking about one time as well was a lot of times when we. And this is where, so later on, this is where that whole, yeah, Shakespeare would make sense to tell the story because that is, he has stories and he's telling stories. So as a storyteller, talking about someone else as a storyteller, you understand the concept of it. But one thing as artists that I think we all have, it doesn't matter if you're a musician, a poet, or, you know, dancer, singer, actor, filmmaker, one thing we all have in common is that I find that we all have some kind of dilemma or experience experience in our life that leads to coping Mm -hmm. you know like why we do what we do some people tell stories so that it can better themselves for me i think it's bettering myself but also bringing clarity to whatever it is that i'm experiencing or have experienced right you know i had a lot of things in life that 
happen, you know, that I didn't have any control of, you know, whether it's, you know, losing my father when I was 10 and not understanding mm. that. And then, you know, the, the, um, experiencing like I, I, my daughter I had when I was 20. So a lot of times during her childhood, you know, I wasn't there because I was, in, you know, doing stuff in the military right. and acting. And so I learned later on to appreciate her and who she is. And, you know, so a lot of times I'm looking back at, okay, you, you know, the pendulum swings both ways. You swung hard this way, but how much did you lose on the other side? So I think the more I matured as a person and, and the stories that I started telling, I, I knew that I liked the art, but I didn't know why. And I think mm-hmm. as I get older, I realize why I like it. And when you put those things into play, then you slowly solidify who you are as a person so that you can perform or create accurately. Right. You know, and that's the maturity of being an artist is because like you have an idea, but then that idea becomes your reality. And then when you put that practice of your reality into play, then you become a better storyteller. That's beautiful, man. That's beautiful. I'm so (laughs) glad, so glad you, you joined me today and, Gave me a chance to get to know you a little bit better and give listeners a chance to get to know you better. Mm-hmm. Um, what's next for Rodney Rodan? Hmm. <laughs> there's, a, there's a few ideas, but um, I, I mentioned or, earlier that when, you know, I, I spoke with my daughter because she wanted to, she wanted to work on something together. Mm-hmm. And I was like, we should do something together later on, you know. And personally, I feel like I wholeheartedly believe that you know, there's a lot of stories to be told in, on different groups, but one group in particular, and, and and this is learning from history, like you read about, you know, Susan B. Anthony and, you know, Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth and all these, mm-hmm. you know, women in the past that made differences. I don't recall seeing, you. there's stories out there, but I don't see too many, mm-hmm. you know? And I think, um, you know, a lot of stories are overtold and some are not told enough. So I think, you know, the next thing I want to focus on is, you know, something with these uh, female leaders in our in history that have, you know, made differences and done things. I, and I want to focus more on that. Well, what a wonderful that story. What a wonderful topic to work on with your daughter, who you said she's a photographer. She she does, she paints a uh, photographer, and you know that, that's something that I look forward to. But it also is the the bond that I think would build. You know. Oh yeah. Yeah, that that'd be amazing. Good job, Dad. <laughs> I hope you guys get that opportunity to uh, create together because that's something that no one can ever take away from either of you. And you know, you put something out there that'll last forever, and that's something that you know the the rest of your legacy that you may not be around for gets to enjoy. Yeah. So I think that's a wonderful idea. Well, Rodney, I got to tell you something. Uh, we were so overwhelmed and appreciative of all of these submissions we received through NDI this year. Um, and we feel like, you know, sometimes we don't have enough categories and sometimes we're like, we have too many and we don't want to saturate our categories just so that people can win awards and things like that. But we felt it was really important going into this bonus show that we're doing and having these end of year awards to really have um, categories that fit. And since we run it all, we can make all the decisions we want. Um, So we have a new, we have an award that is an annual award, even though this is our first annual show. Um, And it is called the Freedom Filmmaker Award. And we have given that to you, sir. So by the- (laughs) Thanks. <laughs> uh, you're welcome. And, you know, and it's it's just Matt and Dre sending you laurels, really. But it's more than that. It's we are so impressed with not only who you are as a person um, and, and your experience and your dedication and your sacrifice for our country. Um, it is also recognizing your talent at what you do um, and how beneficial your talent has been. Um, for the country and just for the message from veterans and giving people a different perspective on what veterans go through, what they experience, and for you shining a light and shining a light in an interesting way 
on these things in both of your award-winning doc shorts. So <laughs> congratulations to you for both of your wins this year. And uh, thank you for being our Freedom Filmmaker of the Year, sir. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm really... <laughs> no, I, I, that means a lot to me, you know. I appreciate that, and it's it's always it's it's, it's always good to 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 hear that and how much that you know what you think or what other people think because it's when we're when we're making things you don't that's not something that crosses our mind we don't we don't know we can't see ourselves or things we do from the outside and so you know to hear that I, I, I'm I'm kind of speechless so. <laughs> 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 well, it's well deserved, um, and and I'm yeah, obviously we're looking forward to whatever you do next. I will sit down and watch anything that has Rodney Roldan's uh, name attached to it. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and where can people best follow you on your journey? Uh, is there a website, social media? Where would you want people to go to keep up with you? Well, I have uh, I have. My, I have a, my regular social media, but I have my actor page as well. And then I have my Instagram that's the same thing. And then IMDB has a lot of updates as well. So I, I'm always updating all of them. And then for the films, uh, we're remembering Private Claudiano and uh, Country and Courage. There's phone pages as well. And I can send those links to you as well. I'll put all everything in one email. Yeah, I'll put everything in the description. Um, and, <laughs> and, and hopefully we'll get uh, a bigger audience. Or Mr. Yeah. Rodney Rodan. <laughs> um, well, sir, thank you so much for joining me. And um, thank you for your service to the country and for your service to filmmaking. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And I appreciate everything you guys are doing. Thank you. Find more information about our guest in the description box of this episode. If you'd like your project discussed on the podcast, go to ndifilmawards.com and submit to our open monthly competition. Find us on Instagram and YouTube. NDI Film Awards. Thanks for listening to this bonus episode of the NDI Film Awards podcast. <laughs>